Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder. And I'll be guiding you through the next hour of our conversations about the future of education and technology. But to begin with, let me explain a bit about where the forum came from, how it works, and who supports it. So to start off with, the forum is a discussion-based venue, hence the name. Uh, we're all about conversation about the future of education. It's a spin-off from an older project of mine uh, called the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report. If you haven't seen that, it's a monthly trends analysis that looks at major trends affecting education and technology. It's been going for nearly a decade now and tracks about 86 trends across a variety of domains. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, go to ftte.us. You can download some sample copies or you can track our conversation with the hashtag FTTE. Um, now, the forum and the Future Trends and Technology Education Report are part of a broader project called the Future of Education Observatory. Now, this is an ongoing, continuous, multimedia, social, and open exploration of how higher education is changing. This includes the forum, it includes the FTTE report, it also includes a blog, it includes a bookstore along with a book club, and some other features about to come down the pike. If you haven't seen this, just go to futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. Now, we can only do this work with the support of certain very helpful people, and we'd like to thank them before we proceed. First of all, I'd like to thank NyserNet in New York State. And this is a terrific nonprofit that helps get that state's colleges, universities, along with libraries and clinics and museums, onto broadband internet and to do great stuff with networking. We're really grateful to them for all their work, and especially for their generous sponsorship. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available the technology we're using right now. So if you're new to it, or if you haven't looked at it for a bit, let me just take you on a brief tour and show you where all the pieces are. So right now, where I am, and right over here for just a minute, are the slides. This is called the stage. And it's called that because everyone involved can see and hear everybody from up here. Now below us, you can see many, many silhouettes. You can see people smiling, like say George Station, or you can see silhouettes of people. Uh, each of those represents a single sign-in or a login from people around the world. And if you'd like to have a private conversation with one of them, simply double click on their icon. And if they are ready to talk to you, their camera, their microphone are working, and they're in a good frame of mind to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos, and you can have your own private audiovisual conversation, which is pretty neat. Now, I mentioned before, this is all about discussion. So let me show you some of the technologies that you discuss all these issues with all of us. Look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running all across it. And on the left edge, there are a few key buttons. So the first button looks like a number. I think it's 38 right now with a few different human head silhouettes and a little dialog box. If you click that, up will pop two different boxes. The one on the left will be a kind of film strip view of every participant here. So you can mouse over these uh, people and you can figure out where they're all from and get more information about them, which is pretty handy. But to the right of that, you'll see a chat box. And that lets you have a basic text chat with the 18 or so people who've logged in uh, around the same time you did. So I can look here and see Vanessa Vale, Catherine Labadorf, Frank Beafora, Elizabeth Horton, John Hong Shi, and a few others. So that's, we find usually that's a great place for people to have informal conversation Sometimes to try out thoughts or ideas that they would like to raise elsewhere. Sometimes to share URLs or other citations to resources that come up in our discussion. So the chat box is one button. When you go back to the white strip, there are two more buttons that are even more powerful. There's a question mark with a circle around that. If you press that, up will pop a little box into which you can type a comment or a question that you'd like to ask myself or the guest or everybody else. And in fact, people often do this, especially if they uh, aren't able to use video or microphone at the time. Um, so when you, click, when you type that in, we'll put that into a queue. And when the time is ready, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud so people can hear it. Now, next to that on the white strip is a raise hand button. If you click that, that tells us that you want to join us up here on stage, which is really easy to do. If your microphone is working and your camera is good, then you can just join us. And uh, in fact, we can have up to four people here at one time. So you can imagine having my guest, myself, and two of you as a kind of pop-up DIY panel. And we can do that any time. It's really easy to do. In fact, it takes less time to do than it did for me to describe. So you can click the raised hand for video, you can type into the chat box, or you can type a question into the question mark. 
all throughout this hour. You can use those devices to contact us. If that's not enough, if you're a Twitter hound, go over to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE. And we'll be scanning that throughout the hour, and we can bring in questions from there. So those are all the ways that you can share your thoughts and questions, which is the most important thing here. And we're very grateful to Shindig for making this technology available. We're also grateful to another population, uh, our supporters on Patreon. Now, if you don't know Patreon, it's a crowdfunding service, much like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, and it lets people contribute to support a person making something interesting. In this case, it's me making all these projects with the future of education and technology. So if you go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you'll see all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different people. We have more than 100 supporters right now who kick in as little as a buck a month just to keep all the technology humming and to keep the lights on. Uh, you can see here from this um, from this slide, we're grateful to folks like Jeannie Kimahan, Michael Haggins, Bob Johnson, Chris Lott, all kinds of wonderful people who are very generous to their support. We're really grateful to them. We hope you can join them. And uh, we're grateful for them for making this all possible. So that's who supports the forum. That's how the technology works. That's where it all comes from. Now, let me introduce this week's guest. I'm really delighted to have Benjamin Doxtator on. Uh, Benjamin is a, uh, an instructor of language arts uh, at the International School of Brussels. Uh, he is a, also a fantastic writer who has been writing about technology, education, and the future in terms of power, critique, and analysis for several years. Uh, he writes beautiful blog posts, excellent essays. He's widely read, very influential, very thoughtful. I'm so excited to have him here. Tara, why don't you knock the slides off the stage and bring our Brussels-based guest up. And as we're bringing him up, uh, let me just remind you that I'm going to kick off with a couple of basic introductory questions. But over the next hour, any questions you have, this is what this is about. That's why it's the forum. We'd love to hear from you. Greetings, sir. How are you doing? Benjamin, where have we um, found um, you today? Yeah. You're on. Great. Nice to see you. And you. Um, I have to say this is uh, probably the most bearded moment in the history of the Future Trends Forum. <laughs> you, you, yeah, you're, you're, you're beating me by a bit there. Well, I, I maybe have a couple of advantages. Where, where have we found you today? Uh, I am in Brussels, so I am from a small town called Brantford, Ontario, which is near Toronto. And for the last seven years, I have been teaching at the International School of Brussels. So it is uh, eight o'clock at night here. It gets dark really early this time of year. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, really grateful to you, for you making time at night. Thank you. I'm really yeah, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm, I'm very excited. Well, just before we dive into some of the content issues, uh, let me ask, uh, what are you working on this academic year? I mean, I know you're teaching. Um, yeah. What are you teaching and what are you writing and thinking about? Sure. So I teach middle school, uh, English language arts. So that's grade eight and nine. Um, mm -hmm. And actually in grade eight, we're doing a unit on speculative fiction all about the future. Uh, nice. So we're looking at, yeah, we're looking at different texts through the lenses of power and especially looking at characters who are othered uh, and who are rebels and, and how they fit into different societies. So uh, the kids write their own future fiction stories and we sort of, we study writer's craft and look at how other writers do it and try to try to um, steal some good moves from them. And then we write uh, an analytical piece about that. Um, and then I'm also teaching this year for the first time a cooking class as an elective Whoa. class. Yeah, so uh, every other day I've got 20 kids with knives and pans and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a really interesting break from, from doing things like writing. Um, I sort of, I almost feel like real collaboration happens in a place like a kitchen. You have to pay attention. You have to watch what other yes. people are doing and, and sort of work as a team. So it's been a really interesting experience doing that. As far as writing, I feel like I'm a, I've actually slowed down a little this year. I, uh, I've, I've had a blog post slash long essay cooking for a while about, uh, this trend of trying to link genetics to IQ. Uh, and then it's, it's always linked to race. It's always racialized in some way. And this is sort of an emerging trend, uh, on the right 
especially it's, it's especially strong in in the UK, um, but it's also strong in Canada with people like you may have heard of Jordan Peterson. Um, of course, of course. Yeah, he's this. This is part of, of his sort of uh, approach is to argue sort of for like that there is a cognitive elite. It is genetic, um, and he he comes right out and says things that you know uh, white people have higher IQs. So that this has been something I've been working on for a while, trying to um, get a big handle on the different discourses and to write scientifically about it and to challenge a lot of the presuppositions about the IQ tests. Because uh, a lot of people end up arguing is the difference genetic or environmental rather than actually challenging the testing that puts different populations, uh, you know, 20 IQ points below everyone else. The personal edge for this for me is I'm, I'm First Nations from Canada and this is... Right. Or in the U.S., you'd say probably Native American, and this is like you know a, rate, a group that's said to be twenty IQ points below the white norm, and so there's there's a personal angle there for me too uh, about historically that that representation. So those are those are sort of big things cooking, and then in December I'm going to be speaking at a conference in Berlin called OEB. It's a it's a yeah it's a it's a large um, sort of ed tech futurish kind of conference there. So I'm excited about doing that. The invitation kind of came out of the blue, and I was like, "Wow, it's super exciting!" So that yeah, it's basically basically it right now. It's not too far from Brussels. No, it's just uh, you, the nice thing about being in Europe is you can fly between cities. You don't even show anyone ID or a passport, and if you don't have check baggage, you just walk right out of the airport. So it's that's a really nice experience. Oh, that sounds terrific. Um, I have to ask. Um, First of all, please, uh, I hope you can find time for that uh, post slash essay, which sounds terrific. Um, yeah. Second, if I drill down to a little bit, uh, my understanding is, and this is, this is a historical question, is that IQ has always been controversial. I mean, it came out of the U.S. Army in the early 20th century. Yes. I remember in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot of serious criticisms tearing it apart from everything from uh, racial bias to gender bias yeah. to just being bad social science. And I, yeah. I thought it was, it was at, it reminded me a bit of um, polygraph tests. I mean, known yeah. to be massively flawed and uneven, and just kind of used as a crutch if you didn't have anything else. What's yeah. what's bringing them back? How come how come people are taking it seriously? Uh, it, it seems to come in waves. In in the Mismeasure of Man, Stephen Jay Gould wrote about different sort of waves yeah. of it. I think at that time he's writing about sort of third wave. Um, this fourth wave tends to be people who are part of that sort of new rationalist movement. So like uh, Sam, Sam Harris and I think Jordan right. Peterson would probably put himself somewhere in that area. Um, so Dawkins, yeah, Dawkins definitely. I, I haven't seen him write about IQ directly. Um, there's another guy in the states, Matt Ridley, um, uh -huh. or sorry, in the UK, Matt Ridley. He's uh, like something like the fifth Viscount Ridley. Who's, he's a coal baron and he's a climate <laughs> science denier. Who knows why that would be. Um, it's, and it's usually used by people who want to argue that we have hit meritocracy. So I think yeah. that's why they're going to IQ. Yeah. And so what they say is all the stratification yeah. you're seeing is because of meritocracy. So one of the big researchers there is uh, uh -huh. Robert Plowman, who's from the US and is now in, in the UK. And, and that's sort of his argument is that we've kind of hit meritocracy. So if there's a high heritability of IQ, it means any differences you see are genetic. And he's done research on um, uh, scores for high school and score and test scores in university, and tried to argue that there's a strong genetic component to those scores. Um, a lot of that research is, is quite frankly, bullshit. Um, and Eric Turkheimer, who's a who's a, a behavioral geneticist in the U.S., has called it out as being pretty pretty empty. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think it's part of that. It's it's a uh, it's a tool that they can use to make that argument. So if we're going to so have I, escalating I think it, inequality, like a handy, this is a handy at, at, at hand tool to use, I think. Yeah. Oh, um, friends, I, I have a, about 88 questions that I'd like to ask Benjamin, and you need to stop me. Um, I, I'm going to start with a couple, but um, he has written widely, and as you can hear from our conversation just now, he's going to write even more widely still. So please come forth with, uh, with your questions. Uh, again, and use the uh, click the raised hand if you want to join us on stage, uh, bearded or not. Uh, click the uh, question mark if you like to just quickly type in a question. And uh, in the chat box, uh, please uh, please share your thoughts. 
Um, you've written so widely and on, on such a variety of topics um, that I, there, there are a few of them I'd like to ask you to expound upon a little sure. bit. Um, and uh, one of them is thinking about 2018 and where we stand with education uh, worldwide and also technology. You've written, where do you see pedagogy unfolding? And by this, I mean, where do you, independent of your actions and my actions, where do you see the trend lines headed for that? And where do you think we should be headed? Sure. I, I think there are um, two broad trends that, that, that fall into two sort of political camps. I think people often want to say it's not political, but I, I don't see how that argument works. Um, one tends to be a camp arguing, uh, so part of what I write about is a criticism of people who say that um, you know 65% of jobs haven't been invented yet. Therefore, we have no idea what the future is going to hold. And that argument then tends to be, we should prepare kids to be flexible, which basically means prepare them to be precarious entrepreneurs. Right. And so that, that kind of line of thought is, uh, they, they make a lot of dichotomies. Like, are we going to teach kids facts or skills? Uh, and, they, and they tend to go for that, that skill area. And, um, and I think... I see that partly as a reaction to a traditional kind of education that mm -hmm. didn't didn't give room for things like creativity. There's mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff in this argument because those people tend to favor the arts, you know, having good music programs and so on in schools. But it tends to be very um, what I would call neoliberal focused um, about market demand, and the, almost every argument is framed in terms of the market. So if People will use things like the uberfication uberfication of education mm -hmm. almost as a positive thing. I think Uber is good. And I'm like, whoa, wait, <laughs> there's there's serious labor issues with that. And so I think my big issue with that is that it's not thinking critically about um, yes, kids need vocational skills, but kids also need to understand the history of that economic order, where it came from, what shaped it, what can be done to change it, rather than just assuming that we should prepare them to fit in it. Especially because the, the people, so I work at a very privileged institution, it's an international school. Most of my students will have no trouble fitting into that future because of the privileges they have. And so I think when you're, when you're framing it through that lens, it's, it, it guarantees you're going to leave people behind who've are, who have been already marginalized. And then sort of reacting against that trend, there's a very strong uh, neoconservative push. Um, mm -hmm. This is people who are like Teach for America. In the US, it's Doug Lemov who writes Teach Like a Champion. And then same in the UK, uh, there's, um, there's a, people uh, might know Michael Gove. He was their education minister. Uh -huh. And it tends yeah. to be very, um, they use the word no excuses. So that means no excuses for any behavior. Some schools actually on their website post that they think it's a good thing to give kids a detention if they don't have a pen. That this, because, and their approach is, well, you need to teach those kids responsibility, by which they usually uh, mean uh, poor children of uh, color, um, and that that's the way forward. And um, so it's, it's very rigid. It's based on that kind of broken windows idea of policing, that if you go after the smallest infractions, then everything else will be under control. And they tend to be very uh, traditionalist, so where... The, the one path veers off towards innovation, the other path veers off towards back to the classics, memorization is good, lectures are good. Um, and so what I think both of these approaches leave out of the middle is a critical path. Um, that, that path that goes towards the sort of fun, engaging pedagogy tends to leave out, say, a really critical revision of the canon, say, in literature. So looking cool. at what authors are we teaching and and um people use the word diversity which i think is too weak but like really doing a, a critical investigation of of what representation we have and what voices are heard and voices are not heard so they tend not to talk about that power part so i think i think that's the part that on both sides we need to bring in we need to center that power part and i i um i agree with that sort of leftward trend to really focus on student engagement I think it needs to be done more critically. And then there's parts of the sort of more conservative pedagogies um, that are important. Like I, I have no interest in throwing out the idea of a lecture completely. Um, but, but I think that it, it, it tends towards a very disciplinary and authoritarian 
thing that wants to essentially keep kids under the thumb of, of, of teachers. And so I think it's a sort of anti-youth stance. So those are, those are the, the two trends I see going and they tend to, I see them go back and forth. So I think each trend depicts the other one as winning, <laughs> right? <laughs> that, you know, we've had too much progressive education and that's why we have right. bad test scores. We need to go back to basics or we've had too much back to basics. Now we need to, and you can like trace that back to, you know, to Sputnik being launched and, you know, that, that reaction in America wanting to then go back to basic science to, to beat the Russians. And I think it just flip flops. That's my so take have, anyways. Well, that's, that's what I was asking. And that's a, that's a very yeah. rich take. Um, uh, Tara, um, if you could bring up our, um, our, our new commentator, uh, George station, uh, well, um, let me say it's, it's fascinating to see that, uh, we have, um, such old pedagogical ideas still continuing. So the future is as always stemming from the past. Um, but before I go further, uh, George, greetings. Hi, Hi there. Nice uh, to meet you. Hey, Benjamin, and finally, right? It's so nice <laughs> to finally see you. I know, and to, to hear your voice. Uh, yeah, really it's good. great. Yeah, well, uh, Benjamin and I have uh, been chasing each other around on Twitter for quite a while, uh, uh, just so everybody has context for that. <laughs> but but uh, um, yeah, uh, so um, um, I wonder, Benjamin, if you would maybe comment more on what I'm hearing as the cognitive dissonance of certain parts of the higher ed movement. Well, no, all the way through the educational yeah. reform movement, especially. So on the one hand, you've got this meritocracy thing with, uh, you know, people saying, well, if we've achieved meritocracy, um, my challenge to that is no one has ever checked with me as to what constitutes merit. And yeah, what the criteria absolutely. for merit are. Um, nobody asks me. They, you know, somebody just comes along and says, "Guess what? It really is IQ after all." You know, or, or whatever the criterion is, right? Or it's SAT scores, or it's you know, in the U.S., it's whatever it is. And nobody ever has. I literally, no one has ever asked me. You know, uh, that one. So I'm not even sure I've got a good good answer. But there's the people who believe that can also be the very same people who will say you get detention if you don't bring a pencil to school. And it tends to be that side. It tends to be the conservative yeah, kind of view. Yeah, it's going to. Yeah. I mean, I think it, and I think if we check, it's literally not even figuratively going to be some of the same people sometimes mm -hmm. that have yep. that kind of hold votes. Well, you know what? That's as good as those people, other people's kids. Um, you know, I think um, Lisa Delpit uh, uh, in the U.S. really talks about and writes about or has written about other people's kids, right? Yes. The issue that, yeah. yeah, our kids are fine in, you know, the Waldorf schools or whatever's going on. But other people's kids need this rigid whatever. Um, and But also, they other people's kids can't do any better. So I guess we're at that point where we can j declare that white people are genetically superior, you yeah. know? So, yeah. but how can the same people hold both of the, those ideas in their heads at the same time is, I think we're, oh. I'm wondering if you have more to say about that. How they can hold the, the merit part and the detentions for yeah. counsel's part. I think, I think and, what, yeah. what, for them, it's, I think the, the psychological thing that links it for them is grit. So oh, okay. if, if on the other mm -hmm. side, it's flexibility and creativity, mm -hmm. on that side, it's grit. And so yeah. like by, by, by having no excuses, we're going to teach you that grit. And so then it's all merit from there. So I, th I think that's the, okay. the linking thing. Um, and okay. So and grit is in the uh, um, Angela uh, Duckworth, the Paul Tuff, uh, that, that grit. Yeah. That and I, I don't think it's, okay. I don't think they necessarily take it, take it directly from the research. I'm not sure how close that link is, but that tends mm -hmm. to be the kind of thing that it's, um, and a lot of their, their focus and the no excuses is like a pretty direct behavior modification kind of program, you know, to make yeah. kids super compliant. So w even when they say grit, they don't mean like the grit to challenge the teacher over what they're teaching. <laughs> they mean, yeah. they mean, you know, yeah. grit to get your pencil and sit down and shut up and, and listen kind of thing. So I, mm, I think, yeah. I think that's kind of the link. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. That that's my yeah. um, kind, of, kind of my st starter question. Other than just hopping on to say hello, you know, face. Thank you face for that. Face. Well, yeah. Uh, 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 Joe, just I'd be glad to defer. Oh, sure. Uh, where are you right now? 
Oh, I am uh, in uh, um, Monterey. I'm literally in Seaside, California. I fell for actually the stereoty stereotyping trap here. Um, we always say Monterey Bay Area because it's Cal State Monterey Bay is the official name of the school, and it's really a stone's throw, you know, from the water. But the wow. uh, but we're but we're literally situated in um, Seaside and a little bit of the campus and the housing is in Marina, California. So there are different towns that are all butted up against each other. And um, and so the campus used to be an army base called Fort Ord, uh, which has a oh. rich history. And in fact was um, it, on the States, uh, United States side, uh, because it's on the West Coast, this is where they sent um, actually uh, most of the uh, um, mixed race families, uh, soldiers, and so on, um, in the forties, fifties, and sixties, because they literally could not safely send them anywhere else, uh, like in the into the deep south, and so on. Sometimes, sure. So, sure. Um, so basically, there's a whole past here that is not about higher education, um, uh, but uh, we're kind of, and the campus has been here about twenty five years. So it's a it's a uh, interesting, uh, um, unique vision within the 23 campus Cal State system. It is, thank you. And uh, thank you for being a longtime friend of the program. I have to say, I, I've just had to boast, we have, um, we have one guest all the way in Brussels. We have uh, the host in the east end of the US and we have a <laughs> fine participant in the west end of the US. So we've covered a good stretch of the earth easily. Yeah. And, I think, and I think you've got, you've got Canadians, uh, other uh, like in, who are in Canada in the room as well. I think. Oh, cool. Uh, I That's think I saw a couple, a couple of others. Yeah, uh, Canadians so good, always good luck. I think there's there's more beards in the room, is what I'm saying. So keep on. They're 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 around. I, I think I saw. I might have seen uh, Stephen and somebody else in the room as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, George. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Uh, on that. On that note, let me invite everybody. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat box, we're covering a lot of ground rapidly. Everything from um, Canadian media right-wing superstars to uh, American <laughs> policing technology um, to pedagogical history. So if at any point you have a question or a challenge or even a question of what is broken windows, please use any of the methods possible. Uh, don't let me hog the mic and the camera. We have a lot to cover. Um, and as you can see, bringing up someone on video is easy as pie. Um, I have to say, that was a fantastic answer to George's great question, uh, Benjamin. Let, let, let me ask a bit if to press you on a method there. One of the things that I admire about your writing is that you situate questions of education, pedagogy, and schooling so thoroughly in broader questions of power and social dynamics. How, how do you do this now? What's, what's your approach? What's your method? Are, are you, is there a particular school of thought that you're following or any practice that you'd like to recommend to people? Sure. Um, as, as George Station mentioned, Lisa Zelpit uh, is definitely one of the, the, the big influences on me. Um, uh, people like Henry uh, Giroux, who is American but in Canada, critical pedagogy. Um, obviously, Paula Ferreira, James Baldwin are all people that I really started uh, reading. And so I find that 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 because of sort of I have that base, it's sort of then a lens through which I look at other things. And I think one of the one of the things that really struck me was how those voices are absent from what is taken to be a sort of mainstream liberal progressive movement, which I find really frightening. So a lot of the people who are sort of the big social media stars in that in K to twelve education, those kind of works never appear in what they're talking about. That kind of critical pedagogy strand. Um, Gloria Ladson Billings is definitely uh, mm -hmm. another huge influence. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to dig into any of those if you have more questions, but I think that sort of, that sort of background and framing, um, and also a really good reading of John Dewey. I think a lot mm -hmm. of people have a sort of, have a caricature of who Dewey was and what he said and what he argued for. And um, one of the things that really shaped me there's an article called uh, How Dewey Lost, which is about how his vision of progressivism lost to uh, a guy named Dave Snedden. And Dave Snedden was arguing against Dewey for a very narrow, vocationalized kind of education. Um, oh. yeah. And so Dave Snedden's view essentially beat Dewey out. Um, and Dewey said something like to Snedden that, our, our differences are, are political. Like, I don't want to, 
I'm not so in love with the capitalist order that I want to fit kids into it. I want to, to challenge it and transform it. And so we sort of have this vision that we're left with a John Dewey system, which I, I don't think is, is entirely accurate. So going back and, and reading some of those debates that were very vigorous um, are now closed off. Like I don't, I don't see that same debate main stage anymore. Um, same with things like child-centered learning. Um, that sort of is the, the, the new big progressive thing. But it's something he was skeptical of. He was skeptical of this dichotomy between children and curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so and so he was talking about the agency of children. He cared about that, but that wasn't you know a free range, let kids loose, you know, no structure thing, because he, he, he believed that you know part of development were those structures. So I think some good close readings of people like that have also really opened my eyes to things that have been kind of closed over um, in some of our current debates. Well, that really helps a lot. I think you just. Um when you're not teaching uh, middle school students uh, cooking and speculative fiction, I think you have the excellent power to teach all of us uh, critical thinking and ways of inst instantiating higher education as well as primary and secondary school in the critical it's tradition. very kind of you. Thank you. Well, this is a, by the way, How Dewey Lost is a fantastic title. Um, yeah. That's a, that's a, you know, the, re the reference to uh, the, the other Dewey in uh, American history um, is very funny. Um, and I just put a link to that in our chat box and also just put it up on, on Twitter for everyone who wants to see it. Um, friends, I, I want to press on uh, Benjamin for this um, with uh, a few more points. But again, uh, I would love to uh, uh, have you join us. And so um, if you'd like to, please just click any of these buttons. Uh, we had a quick observation from uh, Kay Novak. Uh, who uh, referred to uh, the uh, history of, let's see, knowledge coming from family, community, and culture, um, and how that's, uh, that's a key thing. I believe, Kay, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying that's something that often uh, IQ tests miss, um, but also most standardized curriculum misses. Um, so I guess I'm asking both you, um, uh, Kay, and uh, Benjamin, if you want to speak to that. I'd love see. to hear Kay speak to it. Yeah, yeah me too. Me too. Let's see if we, see if you can go. Not everybody has a, uh, a microphone oh, okay. and, and bandwidth that works. Um, so um, my goal is for everyone to be on video all the time. Um, but, you know, people, some, I mean, all the infrastructure limitations uh, worldwide can, can be issues. Also, people sometimes might not be in a space where they can ask a question. So right. if they're in an airport or a subway, for example. I've actually done one of these from crazy locations, including conference centers and uh, um, subways. Uh, for everybody else who just saw this on the screen, um, on the other side of me, on the other side of Benjamin, you'll see a little teal colored box that says join podium. So if you'd like to be on video, you can simply click that and up you pop. And someone just did that as I was saying it. Fantastic. Uh, Victoria Romano. It's so good to see you, Vicky. Hello. Well, see, there's the moment of pause to make sure that the infrastructure lines up. Hello. Are you there, Vicky? I am. Can you hear me? Oh, blessfully. So glad to see you. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'm a new grandma, so I'm very excited to be here as a grandma now. Oh, so. Congratulations. Wow. <laughs> so, so my heart for education is even bigger now uh, with, with the new little one. So, um, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I used to teach in the K-12 arena. Now I'm in a uh, community college here in eastern Iowa. Um, and I'm just wondering what, what avenues... Um, what things can we do as, as you know, faculty are, are, are so wonderful and, and work so hard. What, is there a way that we can implement some of those methods and other uh, teaching historical philosophical ideas with faculty? Um, you know, we try it all. We try face-to-face -face sessions, online courses, uh, uh, just ways to meet people and greet them. But what would be some key topics that we could go in terms of with faculty to to build that teaching base, that pedagogical base, just, just for them to hone all that they do. Yeah. Um, I, I think Bell uh, Hooks's book, Teaching to Transgress, is a great one because oh. she walks through her own teaching. So there's some really good uh, vivid parts in there where she's talking about what it's like, you know, to be there, to be the one at the front of the room. Um, and I think she breaks down really well the importance of different moves. Uh, so she talks about the importance of, I think this may um, touch into K, uh, to Kay's question, um, if, I, if I understand her question right, 
about the importance of centering students as knowers and, and having knowledge with them and that their stories are are also important um so that that i think i think reading something like that as a as, and discussing it um discussing how it applies and fits and, and how it fits with with your identity as a teacher is, is a good one um i I'm, I'm not sure i i know the exact answer to it because it's i i think yeah. it i think it i think something like um a good reading group where where different people put forth things that they find interesting and then have discussions about it uh I think a lot comes from the discussion um, and then modeling the pedagogy you want to see. So that's, that's why I would suggest people bring their own things to it because what you want then is for them to take that to the classroom and for people to invite students to bring in their knowledge. So I, I think that trying to model that because all too often in a lot of education, um, like I know when I was in teacher training, <laughs> the, the pedagogy they wanted to see us do wasn't what they were doing to us. So I, right. I think that can be... I think that can be an important thing to yeah. keep in mind. Okay. Yeah, we have kind yeah. of that, that piece going well, um, but okay. it's the, I was thinking more of the, like the reading, the discussion, like just those pieces that just, because it's so great to get in those conversations with people, especially yeah. those that delved into their content areas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, in uh, friends, in, in the chat box, we've seen a whole bunch of ideas and, and links come come back and forth, um, including uh, Kay was able to link to uh, a great article about cultural capital. Um, so, and please keep these uh, please keep these humming. Um, Does it sound like I kind of touched on what Kay was asking there? Or did I understand her question right? I think so, but I, I asked Kate to say more. And again, Kate, if you can join us on the podium, please feel free. Otherwise, just keep using the chat box. And I'm, I'm happy to relay that back and forth. Yeah, because I, I take her to be asking about, you know, who has... Oh, here, great. There we go. Woo! Hello, Kay. There's a moment to make sure that all, everything lines up. Yeah. And I always want a dramatic sound effect, like a gong or a bell or a drum roll or heavy metal can chord. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can. You're right. You're right. Yeah. That's a good taste. I mean, that's a... So while she's coming up, friends, um, yeah. again, um, uh, I, I think it was a great answer, by the way. I think you, you really, what Vicky was posing was a, a real issue for a lot of support staff around the world of how to nudge faculty forward in the kind of directions that you're outlining. So thank you for I that. Think the, I think the other part of that answer, too, is, is time. Um, I, I don't know how much time those like people have to do that kind of development for themselves. Like if you're teaching a ton of courses and you have a ton of grading and uh, you have all those pressures, um, it can be hard. Th that's sort of where the title of my blog comes from. So I talk about taking a long mm -hmm. view on education because we're often mm -hmm. in the short view. We're often mm -hmm. in what do I need to do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. At best, we have a middle view of like a semester plan, but we rarely have the time and energy to, to step back on, um, I don't think that's an accident. I'm not sure that a lot of institutions want us doing that. I don't know. Oh, I think I think you're right. I think you've discovered precarity. Uh, Kay, yeah. can you hear and see us okay? Kay Novak, are you there? I am trying. We oh, can hear you. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. I, I have no idea if the video is working, okay? You're it's great. It's working gorgeously. <laughs> okay. What, what, I, what I just want to say, what you were talking about, was it didn't seem like there was any acknowledgement of the, the funds of knowledge that students bring with them. You know, whether, whether they're bilingual, whether, yeah. whether, they're, whether they're migrants, so that they have more than one culture that they're bringing in, or if they're indigenous. It, it, didn't, it didn't sound like any of this was, was being acknowledged. Are you seeing that, are you seeing that anywhere? And, and nothing about cultural capital either. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um... There's Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Kendi, I'll, I'll put a link in the bottom, um, has a great article about this, about, he calls it why the academic gap is a racist uh, idea, or sorry, the academic achievement gap is a racist idea. Mm -hmm. And he, and that's pretty what, much what he directly talks about is what kinds of knowledge are legitimated, what kinds of knowledge aren't legitimated. Um, because on, on IQ tests, they're actually, 
very culturally specific, even the ones that pretend not to be. It's like those ones where it's like a pattern and you have to fill in the missing things. People point out that it, it presumes even things like you're reading the pattern left to right. So there's there, there's bias built into all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think Gloria Ladson Billings and uh, Django Paris are people making really good arguments for, um, she calls it culturally relevant pedagogy and uh, they both call it culturally sustaining pedagogies, which are which are about that, about centering the knowledge of the community, the knowledge of families, the knowledge of the, the, the people bring. Um, I think in a lot of courses that's not done. Like I studied philosophy, and I and it's it was I think I had a good education in it, but it was pretty standard. You know, start at Plato and move forward, and there wasn't um, many thinkers of color, many women, and and so I don't think that it's. I don't think it's being attacked very vigorously. Um, what, what are you seeing? Um, well, I, I guess, and I'm community college, and my, my students are second, third, fourth chancers, and, and I am myself, so okay. <laughs> I'm just like them. Um, yeah. What I'm seeing in my students, and that's why I put the, the Yasso article there, is I'm seeing, while well, not grit, because to have grit, you need to have slack. You can't be worrying yeah. about where you're going to get your meal, your next meal, That's great. and if you're going to pay your rent. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm talking community college level. Yeah. With that, you can't you can't have grit if you're worried where your meal is going to come from, or if you're going to be homeless. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, so, so I mean, as far as that part, you know, I believe we have to make sure our students have the slack to have that grit portion yeah. of it, and a lot of the That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and and one of a lot of I those wonderful it. success stories that of people who have overcome a lot somewhere along the way they they did get that slack somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing with the cultural capital, here's what I'm seeing from my students. I'm seeing aspirational capital, um, meaning they have really high hopes and their hopes don't get crushed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and they're they're you know they might not be do they're persisting even if it takes them a very long time, even if it's saving up enough money to take that college class and, and things like that. So I'm seeing so I'm seeing a lot of aspirational capital. And then I'm seeing a lot of resistance capital, especially among my students who, who aren't white, meaning they have a whole heritage of resistance, um, whether it's coming from their churches, from their families, from their communities. And they come in, and they come in, and they come in a bit, they come in willing to fight, you know, knowing that things are going to be hard and they're going to have to work through it. So I'm seeing that part and, and I'm not, you know, my students aren't the students who are going to get into the Ivy League schools. And and they're okay and and, and they're going to be okay because they're, they're working through everything. And I don't, I don't see what that, we're, that at a lot of other places that it's being recognized all these other factors mm. so yeah that's, that's, and i'll leave i said enough <laughs> that's fantastic kate thank you that's terrific uh i'm glad she made it um and uh what a wonderful thoughts um you know we had um we had a book club reading of this fantastic book um uh, i don't know if you had a chance to look into we make the road by walking the uh i haven't seen book. that now well, it's a strange book. It's it's not exactly co-authored. It's the recordings of discussions between Paulo Freire and uh, Miles okay. Horton, and so it's it's ninety five percent of it is the two of them talking about pedagogy, um, based on their own fantastic distinct careers and their overlaps and their differences, and it's um, yeah we did a book club reading of it. I'll, I'll just put this in the chat box. It's um, I'm not sure if it's in print, but it's a very very powerful book. And part of it was this idea of starting with students, starting with their knowledge, mm -hmm. starting with their background, uh, what they are coming from, and what what they can contribute, and having them help construct the class. Um, that in many ways doesn't do it justice. There's a, a lot more to it. Um, friends, we're, we're the last 15 minutes of, of the forum. And, wow. <laughs> uh, I, have, I have two huge questions to ask. Um, so this is your chance to preempt me. Uh, so if, if you have a comment or a question about anything from uh, from First Nations uh, origins to um, pedagogy to technology, this is a great time. Um, in By the way, 
in in chat we're having a string of wild um, ideas Benjamin thank you for adding the uh, why the achievement gap is a racist idea article um, it's a great if you, if, if his book but, is fantastic too um, what's it called? It's, a, it's a whole history of, of racist ideas in America it's a fantastic book um, but yet that that article there's some powerful powerful stuff in there well, we have a question from Taylor Kendall uh, let's see if we can flash Taylor on the screen and uh, this is like the, the Colorado Mafia session. We have just Colorado people after Colorado people. This is great. Taylor says, in your recent field guide, you reference Friedman's claim that the most important competition is no longer between countries or companies, but between ourselves and our imagination. Can you expand yeah. on that? Sure. Um, I am put all my cards on the table. I'm no f f fan of Thomas Friedman. Um, Who is? I mean, that's <laughs> the thing. I can, I can never yeah. figure this out. Uh it the there yeah the world is flat became a huge book in education um him and dan pink are mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in the k-12 thing i don't know how mm -hmm. much they show up in the university part but in k-12 they're huge um yeah i think that goes back to what's driving that sort of faux progressive narrative um so it's almost the opposite of the, the conservative meritocracy idea now the world is wide open there's nothing you know, holding you back. Um, mm -hmm. It's just your, only your imagination holds you back. Um, I think that like a lot of people, he underestimates the extent to which those quote idea jobs are very dependent on physical work. Um, you know, so like we, we think of these technologies as like iPhones as being lightweight and clean, but we don't think of where, where the, the minerals are mined, where the phones are disposed of and so on. So I think right. it's a very sort of elitist view. Um, and yeah, if you know, if you have your imagination and maybe dad's loan of a million dollars or something, then sure, <laughs> your imagination is <laughs> the only thing holding you back. Um, yeah, and I, I think that educators who, who buy that on, I don't think they're doing it out of a harmful impulse. I think we like the idea we, we believe in transformation. We're hopeful. We, we believe all of our, we want to believe all of our students can make it. So I think, I think that's why those quotes resonate with educators is because we do want to believe that we can empower children. Um, and so I think that's why I think it's important to challenge, uh, and, and to challenge it in a way that doesn't squash hope, right? So it's not, it's yeah. not, it's not to squash it and say, there's no point in doing anything. Um, yeah, so that that that's my sort of take on on his. My own my own theory is that we're still this is an exhaustive, but that we're grappling with what happened with income inequality. That we sure. we did not, we designed a lot of K through twelve and a lot of higher ed in the fifties and sixties when we were much yep. less unequal. And so now we're we're dealing with trying to cram that system into a new context, which doesn't always work. And. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, so. You mentioned before the idea of IQ being used to celebrate um, inequality in a sense. Well, okay, well, if we have inequality, it's for scientific reasons. It's sure, it's yeah. we should, which forgets the fact that, by the way, the term meritocracy is from a comic novel, which I still yeah. haven't read. It was designed as satire, but but we, we live in this. Well, incidentally, I don't know if you know this, one of hmm. the biggest proponents of this eugenics IQ stuff is the son of the guy who wrote that book. Hmm. So, it yeah, was so his, yeah, so his name, yeah, his name is Toby Young. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, he's pretty vile. If you, if you, if you look him up on Twitter, he's a pretty vile person. Um, nice. And for a brief period in the UK, he was made head of students at a university. But head of students wasn't head of students. He was head of the, the organization meant to put down student protests if they were inviting people like Richard Spencer to speak on campus. Um, and so he lasted about five days in that job, but he actually has written an article called progressive eugenics where he writes about being in favor of that. So, yeah, well, you had a, <laughs> back in the, in the teens and twenties, you had a lot of progressives who, who did back eugenics. This is true. And this, and that's part of the progressive history we have to confront is that, um, you know, Dewey, Dewey was not writing about issues like, like race. Um, and there were a lot of women of color progressive educators that we don't even know the names of, but who were, who were doing that work. So I think that it's important to confront those parts of the progressive movement. Well, let's, let's turn this around. I'm, I'm conscious of time. 
And friends, sure. we, we, yeah. have, we, have a, we have a podium here. Um, and so if you want to jump on it, now is your last chance. But this is the time in the program where, where we point towards the future of education and technology directly. And you have written very, very well, very critically, um, about some of the bad ways we think of the future. You are, for example, famous for your demolition of the, uh, of the famous certain jobs that won't exist in the future argument. Um, but I'd like to ask you now, what are some of the better ways we can think about the future? I mean, you've mentioned before connecting how you connect pedagogy, schools, technology to larger social issues. What are some of the better ways forward of thinking about what happens between now and the middle of the 21st century, for example? I, I, think, it, I think it has to start with us um, using our sort of full imaginations when we think about students. So like what, what I sort of mean by that is I see a lot of things about um, you know, not having laptops and lecture halls because of like one study that showed that, you know, you don't retain as much if you watch a TED talk and you take, you know, short factual quiz. Um, but I think that kind of cuts off our imagination of what students could be doing with those laptops. Um, and, in, and it's too easy then to fall into that other path of sort of um, what Jesse Stallmull's called student shaming, you know, where you mm -hmm. sort of assume the worst of kids and, you know, um, and what they might be doing on there. So I think, I think we need to keep that imagination wide open when we think through things like that technology in the in, in the classroom and how students can use it and not default to um you know one-off studies and not default to to mm -hmm. negative assumptions about the students so i think that i think that is one way forward and i think that that fundamentally means we have to know the people we're teaching um mm -hmm. We've got to, we've got to know that. So I I think in in some sense, if we want to try to get up there in advance, say where things should go, it's it's a bit um, it's a bit premature in a sense that I think it's got to start being grounded in that, um, and also really thinking about that. Um, Carrie Fasser, who's a British academic, has a wonderful phrase that she calls uh, "principled interdependence," and she thinks that that's how we should be educating kids for the future to think about our principled interdependence between us and the planet, between each other, um, and, and to create classrooms that work on a principled interdependence to model. So I think that, I think that's a pretty, if I was going to go for sort of like a phrase for the future, um, mm -hmm. I think that would be a phrase that, that I would pick as being um, in the right direction. Well, that principled interdependence brings in a lot of stuff. Um, race, yeah. class, gender, but also climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, and the structures of technology. Yeah. But then, uh, where do you think um, where do you think ed tech is headed right now? Not not where you would like it to go necessarily. Yeah, but where, but where is it going? Gosh, um, I think we're going to start seeing things about ed tech and genes. Um, that's part of this push mm -hmm. for IQ and, and genetics. Robert mm -hmm. Plowman has talked about a, a chip that kids would have. Um, if you know anything about the science of genetics, that's totally bullshit. <laughs> um, yeah. I, think, I think that's one thing we'll, we'll see coming up. I think the big things um, that I see are things that people like uh, Chris Gilliard have put on my radar about technologies that are extractive and have to do with surveillance. I think those will be the big things that come up. I think fundamentally because it's not being implemented in a system that trusts kids, right? Mm. So there's always going to be that back end of, of, of extracting data to, so we can score and rank or of surveillance. That's, that's where I fear it's going. Um, yeah. So in many ways we're, we're heading, you see that we're heading towards increased surveillance, increased, increased control. Um, yeah. In the, uh, in the chat discussion, we had, um, uh, Nate Angel was mentioning uh, uh, robots and modifying students with CRISPR, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, but the but but you know this this ethos of control is very interesting. That goes against in many ways the uh, uh, explicit Silicon Valley view of empowerment, um, the yeah. marketing of, uh, yeah. of individual um, development and exploration. Um, but it does seem to match pretty well a lot of educational trends, from testing to surveillance to policing. But it depends on which, which level you slice the Silicon Valley part at. Because, yeah, maybe in their head offices for 15 people, it's not about that. But if you look at the whole product chain, 
it very much is about control about you know in terms of branding where they're manufactured um you know their, their store employees and how they treat them and so mm-hmm. i th- i think that yeah. would almost be the kind of ed tech model even for teachers right yes definitely kathy o'neill is relevant here yeah um where i think you'll have a small section of people in an institution who have that silicon valley freedom but everyone outside that very small pod um you know will need admin passwords to do things and you know it'll be controlled from teachers on on down to kids well along with this then precarity both in the sense of yeah. uh, preparing, preparing most students for precarious jobs but also most faculty um, and staff uh, increasingly being precarious, uh, either part time or academic projections protections. This is a Absolutely. dark view. This is a terrifying view. Uh, <laughs> this is um, this is like the uh, this isn't so much the uh, Trump model as it is the uh, China model. But th- then we ask them going forward, especially as someone who teaches middle school kids and who writes so publicly, where what do you look forward to then? What what are your sources of optimism and uh, joy? Um, I think it has, I think, it, I think it comes from looking at pockets where people are doing the right stuff. Um, so like Robin DeRosa with her, uh, yeah. with the things she's yeah. done with open, open resources. I think, I think looking to those models, um, and having a cautious optimism about that and informed optimism about that. And I think in celebrating things that lie outside of that, that tech bubble, like taking joy in reading a paperback book together as a class. Um, yeah, so I, I'm by no means tech phobic, like our, our school's a one-to-one school. Um, mm-hmm. We use computers mm-hmm. all the time. But I think it's about also uh, informing kids so they understand what's being collected, um, showing them how to do things like protect their data, um, making those choices transparent to them, and also celebrating things like, I don't know, taking a walk in the forest and having a conversation or, or reading a book, I think. It's maybe getting outside, intentionally putting that stuff aside. Intentionally. We yes, have, uh, uh, Dr. Gilliard is at Hypervisible, yes. That's and, the uh, uh, question. A, ter- a terrific uh, Future Transform guest last January. Uh, great fellow, great fellow. Uh, Kay and Novak and uh, Nate Angel spoke of data justice. And, yeah. uh, and I, I think this might be a fantastic moment to end on. Benjamin, what's what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Is it through your DocStatter Twitter handle or through yeah, your... Definitely, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. And, and uh, are you yeah. traveling much? Besides Berlin, are you getting out to the North America at all? Uh, I don't get there. I usually go like once a year to visit my, my family, um, maybe twice, but, uh, no, but not as much. I would love to. I was in at Digital Pedagogy uh, Lab in Vancouver two years ago. Um, mm-hmm. which was amazing. I, I got to meet a lot of people for the first time. Uh, so I, there's, there's definitely events back in North America I would love to make more time for. Well, it'd be great to see you. In the meantime, let thank me just you. thank you. Thank you so much for a tremendous hour. Uh, you have instructed us, enlightened us, scared the heck out of us, and given us inspiration all at once. And you've done so with, with uh, aplomb and a great deal of knowledge. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really honored. Oh, it's a pleasure. Stick around for a minute. We have uh, we have to talk about next week because we are out of time. Um, and while we're putting this up, let me thank everybody for fantastic questions from George to Kay. Uh, it's just been a delight. Thank you all so much. And speaking of which, uh, coming out of our conversation next week, I'm very, very excited to have Jesse Stommel uh, as a guest. Uh, Jesse is the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning at the University of Mary Washington. Uh, and Jesse has done fantastic work in digital pedagogy. He's a co-author of a new book. And we're really, really excited to talk about social justice, critique, and powerful uses of education and technology, especially in the public university world. So that's next week on November 15th. Also coming up, uh, our book club reading is getting ready to start. We will have the agenda up tomorrow on Twitter and tear gas from Zane Tuvechki. So you still have a chance to get your copy of this exciting book which looks at social media, mobile devices, and political protest. 
which may be one of the most important books we could read this year. If you'd like to grab a copy for yourself, uh, we have our book uh, bookstore online, so you can grab it there, the other books there as well. And if you'd like to participate in keeping this conversation going, we have several different venues. So you can keep it going on Twitter using the hashtag FTTE. We have groups on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, on Slack. If you'd like to put questions for Jesse Stommel next week or follow up with some Benjamin's ideas. In the meantime, we'll see you next week. We'll see you all online. And thank you, everyone, for your thoughts, questions, and comments. Take care. Bye-bye.